When I first set out on the journey of making this YouTube channel, I had a home theater setup comprising of a Marantz Pre-Pro with 11 channels of power amplification from Emotiva and a full set of SVS speakers with four in ceiling speakers for Atmos duties and two subwoofers. It was a 7.2.4 setup. When I sold it all off, I was left over with two carton boxes of cables. And then I started taking these videos from the home theater room that I had. That room is now gone and it has been converted to a study where either my wife or me will conduct our business in. Work. Business. Work. Where we will work from. As in when we work from home. The setup was with a 4K laser ultra short throw projector, which was still around for a while after, but the sound setup was replaced with a Sonos wireless home theater setup built around the Sonos Arc. So over time, the space got more and more crowded when two full-size Omni desk height adjustable tables were put in with two secret labs chairs and the space got more and more limited for everything else I had to do in the space. I had to then time share the space between work and video and I didn't quite have a permanent setup for videos and the sound system at any one point in time throughout the week was all over the place. I had to move the subs here and there, move the speakers, move the cameras, move the lighting, move the mics, you, you get the idea. So finally, after two years of making content on YouTube for this channel, I decided that I needed my own dedicated space for making videos, testing out equipment, testing out audio gear, and doing my video edit work. At the same time, I also wanted space to enjoy all the equipment that I have, listen to my music, watch my movies after a long day at work. Well, actually, that's a lie. I don't even have the energy to watch anything after work. In short, I needed a YouTube studio that will serve as a listening room as well as a movie room and that was a pretty tall order for most Singaporeans' home where space is likely to be quite limited, as with my space as well. So after some bargaining with a very understanding wife, I managed to work out a compromise. I get to build a room out for myself by cutting some space from the living room. But I had to build a new TV console for the living room together with a pantry area for her and do up her working space as well and clear out all my gear from the storeroom. And I have a lot of gear. And most important of all, I also needed a desk where I could do my business. I mean, as in work, work and video editing, right? So the topic of the living room and the work from home setup that I had to do for my wife will be another story for another day. Today, I'd like to walk you through my first studio tour on my channel, which you also realize serves as my entertainment room. Now, the first decision point that I have to make is whether to prioritize audio-visual equipment setup or a YouTube studio setup, like how I'm taking a video here. But in either case, it needed to have a lot of storage because remember, one of the terms and condition is that I have to clear the storeroom of all my gear. So while deciding whether to prioritize a YouTube studio or an AV room, a realization suddenly hit me. A good AV studio is also a good YouTube studio. So I went about to create a great AV space where I can retreat into and cut myself out from the rest of the world, the rest of the household. So whatever the requirement was, networking was quite key, right? Wireless, yes, the whole room is, of course, wireless as is the whole house. We definitely needed wireless because well, wireless audio file. The home networking equipment is powered by Ubiquiti, running the Unify series of gear with five access points throughout the whole house. The WAN connection is a one gigabit per second connection. Yes, so technically Wi-Fi 6 should do the trick. The ONT access points from the service provider was actually terminated in the fourth ceiling. So I took the opportunity to layer the entire ceiling with a 1.5 foot drop from the ceiling itself. So there is a fourth ceiling. Now that serves a few purposes. First, it created the space for me to push all the networking equipment into the ceiling, out of sight. And if there was any fan noise or hum from the router, it wouldn't be audible from within the room. And secondly, the drop ceiling also allowed for me to mount the two Sonos, uh, well, Sonos 
in ceiling speakers to act as surround speakers. Now I'm hoping that at some point in time, Sonos will allow the amp to power these real in ceiling speakers for atmos effects. Now third, I had the fourth ceiling reinforced with one inch plywood and it created a matrix of mounting points. The idea was to um, give me the ability to mount cameras, lighting, as well as mics. Now this is after all a YouTube studio and I intended for a permanent mounting position for my mini DSP, you might one, which serve as my measurement mics for all the tests I do on this channel. So all the tests that I've done in this channel is now using a standardized setup with the same measurement position from video to video. Not to mention that I also got to lay lighting strips into the ceiling to create mood using even colored lightings throughout the parameter of the room. Now this really changes the feel of the room. Now in my initial design, I was actually planning to put the nest into the false ceiling. But after evaluating the load bearing of the ceiling against the weight of the 8-bay Synology this station nest, I decided against it. So I decided to put the Synology nest in an enclosed cabinet within the TV console itself. Now, this might be a bad idea on two counts. First, connectivity between the main switch and the nest. Second is the ventilation. Now, I managed to solve the ventilation problem by building a set of ventilation fans into the cabinet on top and the exhausts are drawing the hot air out of the cabinet generated by the this station. The controllers are placed on the side of the cabinet and that allows me to monitor and control the fan speeds and temperature of the cabinet. I thought this was a very cool feature. Now I definitely recommend this set of AC Infinity exhaust fans for your cooling needs should you need them. Now they have a whole lineup that you can choose from so depending on the size and the um, cutoffs that you have, you can choose one that will fit your needs. Now the bigger problem was actually connectivity. So yes, I'm able to achieve wireless speeds within this room at least, right? Um, with my connected wireless devices in the region of over 800 millibits per second Mbps, coming close to the one gigabit per second speed limits achievable by my current router setup and internet connection. But the NAS is still gonna need LAN cables and not to mention it actually is a lot more stable to wire at least one of the solo speakers with a LAN cable. And because I'm concealing and sneaking all the cables behind four ceilings into the wall built in behind the TV console, I needed these cables to be very strong, very durable, and should last many, many years. Now the nightmare would be to have the cables fail and then having to rip things apart just to replace the cables. Now I did a lot of research on which cables to buy and inevitably Ugreen came to mind. Now, I have done a video on their HDMI 2.1 cables before. I was so impressed with them for their compatibility, the build quality, I decided to look at their LAN cables as well. So here we go. Now, I bought a whole bunch of their cables to actually route behind the walls, the cabinets, and the ceiling. So this is actually a box. Now, this is a very, very long cable. I think this is the um, yeah, this is the 15 meters version. Um, I, I got some of these, but this is a spare one that I have. I did manage to use it, but I did unbox some. And uh, obviously I already routed all the cables behind, so you won't be able to see the actual configuration, actual installation itself. They are actually in my ceiling right now. So let's take a look at this copy here right up front. Now, the sleeve is a nylon braided sleeve, right? This is very, very nice. Um, it doesn't kink as much if you Look at the whole run that I have here. Uh, while it's coiled up and all, it actually still runs very, very smoothly, right? So no kinks at all. And if you look at the connector, there's a, it's a metal connector at the tip of this, okay? So very well built. There's a catch right at the top, right? Usually this part clicks into the wall and it prevents it from coming out. But when you pull, this plastic bit actually tends to break, right? So what this catch does is to actually prevent um, this um, clip here from bending outwards and breaking off such that it no longer retains the connection in the wall. So this is actually a very, very well-made cables. They do actually have two versions. This is the round one that I have. They have a flat version as well if you need to sneak it under the carpet or behind uh, some places where 
you need things to be flat. So build quality wise, I have no doubts that this will last a very, very long time. But most importantly, I tested the speeds of this cable. Now, while they are rated for up to 40 Gbps, 40 gigabits per second, these CAT 8 cables are actually backward compatible to almost any existing standards out there. Now, the speeds possibly supported by the cables, it saturated my network equipment completely. I was able to transfer files at a full speed over a gigabit network and the speeds actually topped up at about 120 odd megabytes per second for large files. But this is CAT 8. Right, which means it is able to support signaling and bandwidth up to 40 Gbps. It's far greater than any commercially available network equipment available in 2023. And in the event that I decide to move up to a 10 gigabit network, these cables need not be replaced. I don't have to pull them out from behind the walls or within the cabinets. Now, if for any reason you're going to have to replace your network cables or needed cables to connect up to your Sonos speakers, do consider this. I have to say it will not increase your sound quality. So don't have to ask me that. Don't be tricked by any LAN cables that claim to increase your audio fidelity. They simply don't. But for these U-Green cables, you can be sure it will last a lifetime and they look and feel great. Okay, so talk about cabling. Besides running network cables, I also ran many power points throughout the room. Now, I used high quality wall sockets from Legrand. Now, because even wireless speakers, they require power. They don't need speaker cables, but they need power. So I have them littered all around the room in all corners. So I will be able to power any speakers or subs in any corner of the room or studio lights this camera, the mics, even if it is from the ceiling. Yeah, that's right. I also have wall sockets in the ceiling. Now, I don't use them right now, but they are there for the future. And because I needed to wire up my in-ceiling Sonos passive speakers with my M, I also ran speaker cabling. Now, a pair to the ceiling, a pair to the rear wall, which is opposite the TV, this is in the event that I need to test any passive speakers in the foreseeable future, although they may not be wireless. To round off the design of the room, I had to consider the most important aspect of a YouTube studio and an AV room, and that is for the sound of the room. Every room has its sound signatures. Some rooms are bare with hard walls and large glass panels or mirrors, and that makes any sound system that you place in the room very, um, very lively, very reverberant, right? The sounds are reflected off many times and the spoken words get all gobbled up. Now, just imagine yourself in a very small toilet and you're speaking with someone else, right? Uh, sometimes not in the same cubicle, but sometimes it is hard to hear the other person in the toilet or even to be heard. Now, oppose this as um, speaking to someone in a movie theater before the show starts and the speakers start to blare. When you are speaking to the someone in that environment, you almost have to whisper, else someone three rows away from you or six seats away, they're probably going to hear you because the theater is well treated for sound. Each word and each sound is carried to your ear once and they never get reflected off the walls, the ceiling or the floor to hit your ears a few more times. Each word and and sound is then heard crisp and clear. And that is the state that I want to achieve in this room. To do that, we need a couple of things. First, we need to um, block sound from the outside of the room from coming in. The second thing we need to do is to dampen the sound generated within this room and prevent them from reflecting. Now, I'm definitely oversimplifying things a little bit here, but if we just get these two things right and ignore everything else, the improvements will be remarkable. So first, blocking sounds from outside the room. The largest opening in this room is this window behind the curtains right here. It measures six feet by four feet height. Now, if we leave the windows open, of course, all sorts of external sounds will come in. So I have the windows closed most of the time and the edges of the windows are sealed further with rubber sealing. Now, simple and very effective. They block out most of the sounds generated from the outside. I can hardly hear anything from outside the house. It is a weekend. Usually it is a little bit noisier outside with more activities than usual. But 
you can't hear anything from the outside. The second opening is the door. The door comes in from the living room. At any point in time, someone could be using the living room for news or watching some program on the TV or someone is chatting at the dinner table or the vacuum is running at full tilt, right? I needed to seal this room from the noise that is generated outside. Now the door is a solid core door and it is heavy. Most of the leaks in the sound will come in from the perimeter of the door and that's where additional work is done. The door is rubber sealed and there is a drop seal mechanism at the um, bottom of the door which drops a rubber seal at the bottom when the door is closed and this is automatic. The room is so well sealed that when you try to close the door, the air pressure in the room actually flexes the drywall ever so slightly and the automatic door closer actually has difficulties exerting enough power to close the door against the air pressure completely. Now the air volume in this room is said to be completely sealed. Now this state of the room allows any subwoofer you place in this room to pressurize the air and perform at peak output and capabilities. I have five subwoofers in this room. Not all of them are playing at the same time, but I have five. Now the last part of the room treatment to prevent further external sounds from coming in is actually in the wall itself. As I've mentioned in the early part of this video, this room was carved out from a living room. Two dry walls were erected as partitions to create this space. Now the dry walls, which is the one here, and the one here, this meets at an angle behind me right here, as you can see. If you um, were to cut it open, right, they are actually stuffed with a 100 kg per square meter density rock wool in between it. 100 mm gap. In other words, if you look at the wall, internally you're getting a 100 mm air gap and the rock wool will absorb any sounds that threaten to come in from the outside. This completes step one of the room sound treatment, which is to prevent the external sounds from coming in. Now, for the sounds generated by the equipment in this room itself, those are the sounds that you want to hear once, not reflected. And you want to hear them clearly, so you do need to cut out the reflections in the room. Now, the most important aspect of this was actually the treatment of, that's right, the floor. The floor is the single largest, most reflective surface of the room together with the ceiling. But because my ceiling is plywood, is wood is less reflective than normal, so I decided I need to treat the floor. So when you treat opposing surfaces equally, it, um, if it proves to be a challenge or it's simply too expensive, you don't have to treat both opposing surfaces, you just treat one of them, it should give you 80% of the intended effect. And as I needed to mount several pieces of video equipment uh, to the ceiling anyway, my real only option was to treat the flooring. So the floor in this room uses acoustic carpets. Now these carpets contain an acoustically damped base layer which absorbs sound that hits the surface and returns a reflection with a much reduced level of energy. Now once the carpets were put up in the room, the room deadens significantly. A simple clap test confirms that the echoes and the reverberations in the room are cut significantly. Well, I can still hear a little bit because the walls, they are quite bare now. Now the carpets are really expensive and probably cost about three times that of regular carpets, but in my opinion, are the best investment I've made in this room. It doesn't take up any space at all and it absorbs a great deal of sound. Now the next significant thing that needs to be done to treat any room is the windows. Windows are large surface areas which also happen to be highly reflective when it comes to sound because of glass. Now if you have large windows or large mirrors in the room, you're likely to suffer from a large amount of reflections of sound, especially at um, speech frequency and above, which means to say even your higher frequencies are also reflected by the glass. Now to deal with this, I actually put heavy blockout curtains to cover those windows. Now any sounds that threatens to hit the window, the glass, and reflect back now has to pass through the curtains first, getting the energy reduced and any remaining sound that bounces off the glass after that will have to pass through the curtains again to get back in the room. Now that's the curtain working twice for you. Now this Curtains that I put up, they cover the entire wall, not just where the windows are, it's the entire wall. So this entire wall is 
treated. I have yet to complete full treatment of the room, but even in this state, the room is already sounding great. Any songs or movies that I play in this room is heard with perfect clarity and I'm actually enjoying every moment that I spend in this room. It is a great place to be making videos, enjoying movies, enjoying music. There might be things that I still need to do further to treat the room like the bare walls behind me, um, but I'm going to enjoy the fruits of my labor and start to make videos and watch movies for now. Now, I hope that this small tour of my AV room come YouTube studio has given you an idea of the thoughts that goes behind optimizing a room for AV content consumption. Now, there are actually many other interesting features of this room which I don't have time to cover today. Now, if you're interested in those aspects like lighting control, uh, video camera angles, video lighting setup, mic, sound controllers, sound recorders, working table, TV console, storage, well, let me know and I will make a video on that between any Sonos product launches. Now, meanwhile, I'll let you know that this room is now ready for new Sonos products. What is this product? Well, stay tuned and remember to check out this channel when I launch the product announcements anytime soon. Now, if you want to have a clue, take a look at this video right here that I've linked where I talk about the next era of Sonos speakers to come. And I'll see you over in that video.